The Tequila Worm by Viola Canales, Chapter 15, Another Mundo. We woke up early one Sunday late in August, packed my things into Berta's car, and set out for Austin. I had spent the previous day saying my goodbyes to all my relatives and finishing my packing. I must have been hugged, kissed, prayed over, and drenched with holy water a thousand times. Mama insisted on my taking the family's one suitcase, which was hard plastic avocado green. It needed a rope to stay close. There, I put the five new dresses, other clothes, and the copy of Don Quixote Papa had given me, saying, It'll inspire and amuse you, Miha, on this new quest of yours. Then Mama presented me with a sealed cardboard box. This is for your room altar. I looked at Berta and rolled my eyes. Mama returned with the second box. The first box was for your soul. This one is for your body, she said, putting it beside the other one. What's inside, Mama? I said as I emptied the top drawer of the bureau I shared with Lucy. She could start using it now. A big bag of empanadas and a brand new box of Ibarra Mexican chocolate. After Mama left the room, Berta started laughing. I can just picture you using your comadre props, the pan dulce and hot chocolate, to try making friends with those snooty girls. I don't think they're ever, they've ever seen a homemade empanada before, or talked to a Mexican-American for that matter. I shook my head and went on emptying the drawer, trying to find little treasures to give Lucy. She happily took my rose quartz, my, mar my mariachi puppet, a clown pin, some miniature Mexican ceramic pots, and an old set of tiny worry dolls. And she was especially excited when I gave her my tequila worm piggy bank with a whole dollar inside. But she refused my three-inch praying mantis floating in a bottle of alcohol. My slingshot, my bag of marbles, my wooden top, my plastic magnifying glass that I used to fry ants, and my fishing knife. I knew Berta wouldn't want any of these treasures either, so I put them in a shoebox. No wonder you're always wearing the same jeans and shirt, Berta said. Your drawer is completely full of junk. I just smiled. As Papa drove, he drank black coffee from a thermos while the rest of us ate our breakfast egg tacos, which Mama had made early that morning. Have you heard anything about your roommate? Berta bit into her chocolate, topped concha. All I know is that her name is Brooke, Brooke Fisher, and that my dorm is called Ames Hall. About halfway there, we stopped in Three Rivers to eat lunch at Little Mexican Restaurant right off the highway. Sophia, Mama said, Order a big platter of cheese enchiladas, for it'll be a while before you can come back home. And for all we knew, until then you'll be eating, what, celery sticks and crackers? After I forced the last forkful of enchiladas down, Mama insisted on ordering a plate of hot sopapillas, which we dipped in honey. Then off we went again, this time with the three comadres in front and Berta driving. Papa fell asleep, while Mama opened her big purse, took out her rosary, and started praying silently. Mama Santos were taped onto Berta's dashboard. Lucy's comadre job was to keep finding a clear top 40 radio station as we drove, passing tiny towns and ranches, but mostly mesquite trees, tumbleweeds, and bushes. In Austin, Papa drove round and around until he found a little motel called Casa Mexico. He rented one room with two queen-size beds. We ran across the street to a Mexican cafe before turning in for the night. The next morning, we started toward St. Luke's. I hadn't been able to eat any of those huevos rancheros at breakfast. Sophia, Mama said, are you feeling okay? Yes, I said, trying to sound cheerful. You look as gray as when you put that holy host in your pocket. Berta and Lucy started laughing. I forced myself to laugh too. I didn't mention that I had put St. Sophia in my shirt pocket that morning. Papa turned at a granite marker with the words St. Luke's Episcopal School etched in big block letters and proceeded up a winding hill behind a brand new silver Mercedes. I felt a headache coming on. I turned around and felt a little better when I saw an old white Volvo station wagon with a couple of dents behind us. After three miles of winding up the hill, we passed through a stone gate. Wow, said Lucy, it's like a magic kingdom and it did look like a small magic town on top of an enchanted hill, with the spacious green playing fields, a chapel steeple at the very top and center, and the grand stone buildings around a large quadrangle. There were numerous gardens and small courtyards. As we drove around trying to find Ames Hall, we passed an obser observatory, riding stables, gyms, tennis courts, a swimming pool, faculty homes, a golf course, and the dining hall. So where's Walmart? said Berta. 
Yes, and what about the drive-in, the panaderia, the raspa stand? Dios mio, I wouldn't need the canicula to go crazy here, said Mama, shaking her head. Yeah, said Lucy. Papa caught my eye in the rearview mirror and just smiled. Ames Hall was a two-story white stone building with a small garden in front. A golden retriever was fast asleep on the trim grass. Look, Sophia, Lucy said, why don't you get a pet too? Papa parked between the, sm the same silver Mercedes and white Volvo I'd seen on the road. Your dorm reminds me of my army barracks, Papa said as we climbed the stairs and walked down the hall to my room. The place was Spartan, with rooms opening onto a long stone hallway. There was a bathroom at each end, and a faculty family lived in one corner of the building. There was also a common room on the first floor, which had a fireplace and a bookcase. The walls were covered with framed pictures of students at sports, at teas, at graduation. Where's the TV? asked Lucy, looking around. In the kitchen, said Mama, as we kept looking for my room and smiling politely at the other girls and families, walking around carrying lamps, suitcases, plants, rugs. I don't think there is a TV. Or a kitchen, I said. Dios mio! No Walmart, no panaderia, no raspastén, no drive-in, no H-E-B, no TV, and now no kitchen? Are you sure this isn't a reform school, Sophia? Mama said, shaking her head. Here it is, I said, pointing to my name. They're like cantina doors, said Berta as we walked through two swinging doors. The room was empty except for a box on one of the two beds. Wow, said Lucy, and I thought you were going to live like a princess. This is no bigger than our room at home. The room was about 12 feet by 15. On each side, there were one metal frame bed, a desk, a chair, a bookcase, a three-drawer bureau, and an open closet. The only really nice part was that it had two windows overlooking the garden outside. The cantina doors flew open and in walked a tall blonde girl wearing green slacks, a monogram pink shirt, and brown loafers. Have you seen Brooke? Silence. No, I said. Oh, you must be Sophia. Yes, hi. I'm Terry Gibbs, and my room is just across the hall. Listen, I know Brooke from before. We go to the same country club. Would you mind terribly if we switched? Switched? Yes, I would really like to room with Brooke. We could just switch rooms now, and it would be no trouble since neither of us is unpacked. Well, I don't even know if we can, if it's allowed, you know. And anyway, I'd, I'd like to think about it first. Okay, but let me know as soon as possible. Okay. Terry turned and left. These people have no manners, Mama said, shaking her head. Sophia, Lucy said, come back home with us. Papa just looked at me. I made myself laugh. Let's hurry with my things since you still have the long drive back. When we went back to Berta's car, I saw Terry taking a large stereo set from the trunk of the silver Mercedes. There was a man in a black vest and slacks helping her, saying, Yes, Miss Terry. Yes, Miss Terry. Then Terry started running up the hill. Brooke, Brooke, she said. A girl with shiny brown hair and bright green eyes was walking down the hill with her parents. As I got closer, I saw she was wearing old sneakers, faded jeans, and a white t-shirt with a tiny green alligator. Terry air-kissed the girl and shook hands with her parents. I was taking the box with the altar stuff out of the trunk when I felt a tap on my shoulder. Hey, Sophia, this is Brooke. Terry said. So do you want to switch? Um, hi, Brooke, I said, shaking her hand. Terry, Brooke said, I want a room with Sophia. She smiled at me. Oh, okay. Terry's face turned red. But I promise you'll let me know if you change your mind. And how's your brother Chris? I'm sure he'll go, he'll get into Harvard. Brooke just nodded. She introduced her parents to me and met my family. We spent the next two hours unpacking. Now let me set up your room altar, Mama said as she set the box on top of my freshly made bed. Brooke had already hung a framed sign, chagle print on her wall, one with a lady's face that could be seen as two different faces. She put a small Persian rug by her bed and placed a cut glass vase with pink and yellow roses on her bookcase. Her bedspread was a quilt with a pretty repeating fan pattern. Mama, I said, shaking my head as she tore the tape off the box and pulled out a yellow votive candle, 10 inch statue of the Virgin of Guadalupe with light bulb and cord and the glow in the dark rosary, a framed print of the guardian angel and my late grandmother's favorite saint, the black San Martin de Porres. It was so old and badly chipped that his face was chalk white and his body rotated in three broken parts on a thin wire. Last was a 12 inch bleeding Christ on a wooden cross. Berta kept biting her lip to keep from laughing. 
Papa was sitting on one corner of the bed, calm and smiling, wearing his brown and white boots. Now where should I put your altar? said Mama. Put it on top of her bookcase, Lucy said, so everyone can see it. Then Brooke walk in, walked in carrying a white orchid, which she placed next to the vase of roses on top of her bookcase. Cool, Brooke said, smiling. Is that your home altar? Yes, but how do you know? I said. My parents run a f foundation for schools in Latin America, so I've seen pictures of them. See, mija? Mama said as she proceeded to arrange my room altar on top of my bookcase. And it's for you too, Brooke, Mama said, turning and smiling at her. It'll sanctify your room. She took her plastic bottle of holy water from her purse and started sprinkling. After all the students and their families gathered in the courtyard in front of the chapel for a welcome tea with the headmaster, it was time for Berta and my family to head back home. Those sandwiches were so tiny, Mama said as we walked around Berta's car, like for a doll. And where was the coffee? The hot chocolate? Hi, Miha, I'm so worried for you. Your dorm looks like a prison, and the food? It's like stepping into another mundo. And here I thought that it was the canicula that made things crazy. Listen, when you get back to your room, break open the other box and have yourself an empanada or two. And be sure to share them with Brooke. She's too skinny and pale. The three comadres and papa started laughing. He put his arm around my mom and gave her a kiss on her rouge cheek, which matched her pretty red dress. Take a big bite, Sophia, Berta said, unwrapping a Hershey's chocolate bar. Only if you put your fingers at the tip, I said, and bit down. Mama and Papa walked on ahead of us, arm in arm. And Sophia, Berta said, here's my advice to you. One, comb that crazy hair of yours. Two, always, always button your button straight. And three, kick that girl Terry out of her mind. Oh, and also, remember I promised at Tia Petra about getting good at becoming faraway comadres. With me, too, said Lucy. Yes, Lucy, of course, you too, I said, touching her head. And remember to write me about your quinceanera. Quinceanera? Who's quinceanera? said Mama, turning around. Mine, Mama. I'm starting to plan it, said Lucy, beaming. Papa laughed. Mama shook her head. Ay, mija, now that's a record. You need to tell Clara so. Mama stopped. Sophia, what story do you want Clara to tell as she goes around with her story bag? And don't say none. Even with her stroke, Clara was still telling her stories though now the stories were written on paper and attached to the things in her bag, and we all took turns reading them for her. That my dream came true, Mama, thanks to you all. Okay, now come here, she said as she pulled a pair of scissors from her big purse, and stand still. Before I knew it, Mama had cut off a three-inch lock of my hair. Mama, what are you doing? Now give me one of your socks. What? Students and parents were passing by. Hurry! Berta and Lucy pulled off my sneaker, then my sock, tossing it to Mama. Good. I'm going to make a Sophia doll from this sock. I'll attach your hair to it and give it to Clara for when she tells your story. They all laughed. I kissed everyone goodbye. When I heard Papa's door slam, I felt very much alone. I stood there waving until the car disappeared. Then, with my heart and head pounding, I slowly went up the stairs to my room. Was this the right time to open Papa's secret cascaron? I stopped and reached into my shirt pocket and pulled out the little wooden carving of St. Sophia. I suddenly remembered Papa's words of many years before that our side of town had its own wealth and warmth. I finally understood what he meant. I started climbing the stairs again with St. Sophia back in my shirt pocket, wondering if this strange world would somehow help me understand better not only the other side, but my side as well.